Uh, it is my uh, distinct honor and pleasure to uh, introduce my colleague and friend, Paul J. Springer. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to echo the comments made earlier. Thank you to our hosts here at Cantini. Uh, just first rate support by Paul, JD, the rest of the staff. So thank you for making this possible. Uh, we had 80 degree weather yesterday, but now we are uh, we're back to Chicago land at this time of year. Uh, we're usually here in April, and uh, every once in a while we'll get snow when we're here, so it could be worse, uh, but we are moving in the right direction. Okay, so Paul Springer today is going to talk about the War of 1812, why the United States went to war. He is kind of a, uh, kind of a Gerber multi-tool of military history. Uh, he is the professor of comparative military history at the Air Command and Staff College at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama, a prolific author. Uh, he is, uh, among numerous books, he is the author of America's Captives, University Press of Kansas 2010, Military Robots and Drones, uh, Transforming Civil War Prisons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I am just very jealous of his uh, productivity uh, as another, uh, as a, a uh, somebody who's affiliated with FPRI, Frank Hoffman, a, a general officer once remarked to him that if words were weapons, he would slay all the enemies of the United States. And Paul, I think, is very much in this vein. He is just a prolific guy, and I am very jealous. He holds a PhD in history, in military history, from Texas A&M University, go Aggies. And uh, before he went to uh, the, went down to Maxwell Air Force Base, he taught at uh, USIMA. He is a kind of multifaceted historian. He's done a lot of things on POWs. Uh, he's done things now on cyber, terrorism, et cetera. Uh, You'll see that he's a larger-than-life personality, and I think you will all immensely enjoy his lecture. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Michael. I, I can guarantee there's only one person in the room that's going to enjoy this, and that's me. Uh, the rest of you, it's, it's iffy at best. And I don't think Corey has come back yet, and for that I, I somewhat feel bad, because uh, quite frankly, I'm going to talk about an example when democracies go to war. Uh, so there are examples in history where this sort of thing does occur. Now, I thought she brought up some really interesting points about what war looks like and how we conceptualize war in the 21st century. But to really understand why the United States gets involved in the War of 1812, you also need to spend some time thinking about how they envisioned war would occur and what war would look like. And some of the things that we take for granted today, like the notion that wars occur elsewhere, that it's on somebody else's soil, it's somebody else's stuff being destroyed, they did not necessarily see that as an advantage. In fact, the United States in the early 19th century assumed that fighting at home would actually give you an inherent advantage, that you could draw upon the resources of your country, that the enemy would be at the end of a long logistics and supply line, that the enemy would hesitate to attempt an invasion of a landmass far larger than the European continent. And so what we have is almost a complete and utter reversal about our assumptions of how wars are fought, where wars are fought, and why wars are fought. Now, the War of 1812 is often referred to as a forgotten conflict. It's one that doesn't get a lot of attention. It's occasionally referred to as the Second War of U.S. Independence, um, but most of the time it's just a kind of a marginalized footnote in war discussions of the Napoleonic conflicts of Europe. And that's going to make sense today. Because the United States would not have gone to war with Britain had Britain not already been enormously distracted by Napoleon and his French Grand Armée marching across the European continent. Without that distraction, there's no possibility that the United States would have felt confident about going to war. And I think Corey is absolutely right when she says, look, countries don't go to war if they don't think they're going to win. The United States certainly went into this war with an enormous amount of optimism. Now, generally, I don't like to do slides with a lot of text on them, so therefore I'm going to give you a slide with a lot of text on it. <laughs> this is the only one that I'm going to do that to you on, uh, so if you're hoping that I'm going to provide you enormous amounts of notes and then read it to you, that's certainly not going to be the case. But if you take nothing else away 
Here are the seven key things that I'm going to talk about to you, to you today, and I believe that you get a copy of, of all of these materials at the end. I'm not 100% certain, but if you want them, I'm quite certain you can have them. So, the situation in the United States, post-Revolutionary War, pre-1812. The United States is an enormously expansionist country. In the decades after the United States rebelled and freed itself from British control, we see a massive growth, essentially almost a demand to move population to the limits of our borders, as if that was the only way to ensure that we would be able to hold on to that territory. And we can see from these two maps the type of population density that you're looking at in the eastern United States between 1790 and 1820. This is going to prove to be enormously important to us. The average family about the year 1800 in the United States has eight children. And of those eight children, four will survive to adulthood. So what we have is essentially a doubling of the population every generation. And that's going to allow for enormous expansionism, enormous growth. But it's also going to create its own pressures, its own population and demographic and economic issues that will have to be fulfilled one way or another if the country is going to survive. Now in the aftermath of the American Revolutionary War, the British had agreed to abandon all of the territory that was being ceded over to the brand new United States. But more than a decade after the end of the revolution, the British are actually still in occupation of a number of military outposts, primarily around the Great Lakes region. And they really have no inclination to leave those areas. The United States tries diplomatic protests, it tries sternly worded demands, but at the end of the day, the United States does not have the military capacity to drive the British out of those fortifications. And we know it. And the U.S. government is so committed to cost-saving measures and avoiding the expense of an enormous military establishment that over the course of the decade after the American Revolutionary War, we see the United States Army decline to barely a thousand soldiers and officers. And that army theoretically is tasked with defending an area larger than Europe. So this is an enormous undertaking for that small group of troops, and they have no possibility of driving out British garrisons. They also struggle anytime there's a conflict with Native American groups. Because this is such a small force, and because this force is almost never consolidated into a single area, the typical approach of American warfare in the late 18th and early 19th century is to essentially call together bands of volunteers, do a couple of weeks of minimal drill, and then go marching off in search of the enemy. This is not a good approach to war. This is not probably the optimal way to go about things. And that's why if you look at this chart in the old Northwest Territory, you see a series of defeats. Because American troops tend to go marching into the woods, looking for an enemy that's using the terrain, that's familiar with the area, that's not trying to march in straight lines, and we tend to walk into an ambush. Time and time again, we play into the enemy's strengths. We cede to them an asymmetrical advantage. The British watch this with a certain degree of amusement. On the one hand, uh, the, the relationship between the United States and the British grows stronger over this period, in particular in terms of economic trade. By the time of the War of 1812, about 90% of American foreign trade is being conducted with the British. On the other hand, there is still a certain resentment within the British Isles that the Americans chose to leave the empire. And so if the Americans get their comeuppance from a group of Native Americans, they're okay with that. They're not going to be real sad. And at times, we suspect, not necessarily with proof, that the British might be covertly assisting some of these Native American tribes, in particular supplying them with weaponry and, and maybe even a bit of advice, shall we say, about how to engage in conflict. So there's some seeds of danger that, that are being sown on that northwestern frontier, and those are going to come to fruition fairly soon. Over the course of those first few decades of the existence of the United States, we have to face the question of whether Native American groups are going to be assimilated and brought into the fold as equal citizens and expected to live in the style of European descended members of society, or whether they are going to effectively be pushed out whether they're going to be exiled 
forced further westward, a move that will cause them to engage in conflict with other Native American groups living in the areas that they're going to be driven into. What we see is that in general, European descended citizens of the United States have very little interest in assimilating natives, and the natives themselves have very little interest in joining the European style of citizenry. So we have a brewing conflict. But traditionally, the United States, and even before the United States, the American colonies, had been able to bring overwhelming force against individual tribes on a regular basis. There had been no pan-Indian movement to bring together these different tribes, to unify them under a single leader, and to offer up a significant orchestrated resistance. That all starts to change in the early 19th century. A Shawnee named Tecumseh is going to do his best to rally the Native American tribes of the northwestern frontier at first, but later of the American southeast as well. He's going to try to bring them together. He's going to try to form a confederacy that can resist the encroachment of whites moving into the west. Now, I want you to just keep that in the back of your mind for a little while, because we need to spend a little bit of time looking at the political situation domestically and the relationship with Europe. By 1800, the United States has been living under the Constitution for a handful of presidential administrations. We've had George Washington, who served for eight years, and we've had John Adams, who served for four. And overall, the Federalists, who encompassed those two individuals and the likes of Alexander Hamilton and others, had left the United States in fairly good fiscal shape with a small but semi-professional military, with a respectable number of coastal fortifications, essentially the United States was capable of defending its own territory. It was not capable of any degree of power projection. We did not have a large navy. Uh, we had a handful of frigates, but for the most part we only had small ships, most of which were not particularly seaworthy, not really useful for trying to send an invading force over to Europe, for example. But the Federalists had left us in fairly good shape. But when Thomas Jefferson comes into the presidency, he wins the election of 1800, and he and his Republican brethren have an entirely different idea of what the Federalists had done in office. They don't see the Federalists as having left us with a good fiscal policy and a sound military strategy. They saw the Federalists as reckless, willing to engage in conflict with the Europeans. They pointed in particular to the fact that French and British privateers had a bad habit of seizing American commerce. The United States, for all intents and purposes, got into a naval war with the French called the Quasi-War, uh, which was largely over trade rights. Um, it was also uh, essentially over the, the new French government, uh, essentially expanding, feeling its oats. They'd had a revolution as well. And... In order to try to put some of this conflict behind us, the United States had sent some representatives to France whose job was essentially to try to negotiate out of the problem we found ourselves in. The French were unwilling to negotiate unless we were willing to pay a significant bribe. When we refused to play by the European rules, the French essentially said, look, if you want to pick a fight with us, you're welcome to do so. We've got the second largest navy in the world. We've got the largest army in the world. We're not at all afraid of the United States. The United States, for its part, decided it would be a good idea to try to mobilize an army out of fear of a potential French invasion. So here we are. We've been a country for about 20 years. Our closest ally in the American Revolution was France. And now we're on the verge of an open shooting war with them. But we don't declare war. Cooler heads prevail. And we managed to head this off with relatively minimal damage on both sides. Some ships were seized, a couple of ships were sunk, but we did not get into open shooting warfare. Jefferson is very pro-France. He thinks the Federalists were too close with the British. He opens new negotiations with the French with the objective of purchasing the city of New Orleans. And when the Louisiana Purchase occurs, for all intents and purposes, he doubles the territory of the United States for a minimal investment. So we have a short renaissance in the early 19th century of relations with the European continent. But, and it's a big but, the reason we are able to purchase Louisiana from the French 
is because there's a massive war going on in Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte has seized control of France, he has crowned himself the emperor, and he needs money to keep his army going. So he's willing to sell land that he's never seen, that has almost no French population within it, in exchange for cold hard cash, under the assumption that at some distant point in the future, he'll be able to take those lands back if he wants to. Uh, and there is some evidence in Napoleonic correspondence that Napoleon is intending to do that very thing. Having collected money for the lands, he is then going to repudiate the agreement. In the end, he's not going to get that chance. Spoiler alert, things don't end well for Napoleon. <laughs> but things are going very well for Napoleon. By about 1805, he has managed to destroy all of the continental armies that faced him. That does not make him the exclusive ruler of Europe, but it does mean that he's had a string of victories. And the only country out there that's still significantly opposing the French are the British. They're the only country that joins every coalition against France. They're the only country that never signs any significant peace agreement with France. At all times, the British are a thorn in Napoleon's side. They're driving him absolutely nuts. We in the United States see that as an opportunity. And this shouldn't come as a surprise. The United States has always, throughout its history, been willing to sell goods, including weaponry, to both sides of a conflict if we're not party to it. And we want to do that during the Napoleonic Wars. We expect to be able to trade with both France and Britain without either one of them objecting. Neither one will have an issue if we're selling things to their opponent, to their dire enemy. Uh, this is a very optimistic, very foolish worldview. Uh, countries tend to object when you're giving stuff to the people they're trying to kill. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise to us that both sides are going to try to shut down trade between the United States and their enemy. Napoleon is frustrated by the British. They won't go away, but they also won't come out and fight. They sit on their island, they use their navy to protect themselves, they blockade the European coastline that's under French control, but they won't give him the straight-up fight that he desperately wants. So, to counteract the British blockade of the continent, Napoleon announces no territory allied with or under the occupation of France will be allowed to trade with Britain. He's essentially going to engage in a reverse blockade of the British Isles, and he thinks this approach to economic warfare will bring the British to their knees. He calls it the continental system. Countries, in theory, that are trading with Britain will be penalized. Now, in practice, there's an enormous amount of smuggling. There are always ports that are open to the British. Uh, in particular, Lisbon reaps a windfall from this policy because it's perfectly legal to trade with Portugal, which can then turn around and ship your stuff to the British. Uh, but Napoleon thinks that this will hit the British where it hurts. The British, for their part, are going to retaliate with orders in council, uh, by which they decree it is now illegal to trade with anybody that's a part of the continental system. So if you're the United States, you would like to ship goods to both sides, but now both sides are openly announcing that given the opportunity, they will seize your ships, they will take your stuff, they may even take your sailors and hold them prisoner, or impress them into their own forces. That's not going to go over too well with us. Now to give you some idea of how paranoid the British are about any kind of potential naval threat, when they get word that there is a significant fleet in Copenhagen that may fall under Napoleonic control, even though during the French Revolution virtually every French admiral and naval captain of any repute was executed for being a part of the nobility, the British are so nervous about Napoleon getting his hands on a fleet that they sail into Copenhagen and sink, burn, or seize the fleet. They grab whatever they can. And they are not at war with the Danes but they cannot tolerate the possibility of some kind of a fleet that might threaten the British Isles. And so they're perfectly willing to destroy, to burn, to seize, to do anything that's required 
in order to preserve the existence of their own country. And that's something that if we throw back to Thucydides a little bit, Thucydides would completely understand the notion of eliminating a threat even if it has not been turned against you because a mortal threat cannot be tolerated. If you look at the works of Michael Walzer, who talks to us about just war, Walzer would tell you that if your nation faces an existential threat, there are no longer any limits on what you're allowed to do in a conflict. And that may also become important to us in the War of 1812. Now, compared to what the British are doing at sea, the U.S., under the Jeffersonian administration, has changed its entire approach to naval power. Under the Federalists, we had built at least a handful of frigates. We had started constructing ships of the line, which were the largest battleships of the day. The Republicans cancel all the ships of the line. They allow seven of our 13 frigates to literally rot and be scrapped. So we've got six frigates left. Uh, for comparative purposes, the British have a couple hundred ships larger than that. This is not a fair fight. But we've been building gunboats. Gunboats are effectively rowboats with a cannon in front. They're super awesome. And the Jeffersonians like to refer to this as the Mosquito Navy, that it's just going to swarm you, and it's going to hit you from all sides, and it'll be super maneuverable. It's not. This is a terrible idea. Uh, this is one of the dumbest naval innovations of all time. Uh, these ships are poorly built. If they're not constantly maintained, they rot and sink in under a year. Gun for gun, they're actually more expensive, not less expensive than larger ships. They're harder to crew. And in conflict, if you sneeze on them, they sink. So, so these are not a good idea. But as a cost-saving measure, this allows the Republicans to essentially say, look, you know, we've got the whole coastline secured. Nobody can face our rowboats, uh, which can't go more than a couple miles offshore without being swamped and sunk. So nobody would dare come and, and pick a fight with us. Well, that's just patently false. The British show up all the time on the American coastline. And they do stuff like this. This is impressment. This is the British grabbing somebody and saying, hey, guess what? You're now in the Royal Navy. Good luck. Now, under British law, any British citizen was subject to impressment in time of war. And since they're in the middle of a death struggle with Napoleon's France, it's not a surprise that that means they are pressing people into naval service. It only applies to British citizens, but according to British law, you cannot renounce British citizenship. If you are born in the British Isles, you're British for life. It's kind of like being Catholic. You don't get to walk away. <laughs> and that means if the British overhear you talking and you appear to have an Irish accent, good enough for me, you're going in the Navy. He sounds vaguely Welsh, going in. Scottish, absolutely. British, I can't believe they would even try to avoid service, but we're grabbing them. Now, not surprisingly, a lot of professional sailors within the British Navy would much prefer to not be in the British Navy when they could take service on American merchant ships, get paid about 50% more, not get shot at on a regular basis, have better food, less discipline. It's a great deal. And since the United States is conveniently willing to provide citizenship papers, for pretty much anyone. And citizenship papers don't have a photograph, obviously. They have a very brief description. My citizenship paper in 1805 would describe me as an adult male with brown hair and blue eyes. That's it. So my paper could probably be used by several of the people in this room. And that's exactly what happens. Americans sell their papers to the Brits. The Brits then transfer over to American shipping. By one estimate, there's about 70,000 British sailors serving on American merchant vessels in 1805. They're dodging the wartime dangers, they're making a little money. And the British don't like that. So the British claim that they have a right to stop any American vessel on the high seas and to search for deserters or British citizens that can be pressed into service. The naval tradition says, Warships are an extension of a nation's soil. You're not allowed to do that. But if might makes right, the British are certainly willing to ignore whether this is a moral behavior because, again, they are in an existential struggle. 
they are willing to press anyone into service. And service upon British vessels is no fun. As you can see from this wood carving, you've got the officers on the right, you've got the enlisted on the left, and they want nothing to do with each other. Officers in many ways are absolutely terrified of their enlisted personnel who given the first opportunity are likely to launch a mutiny. In turn, the enlisted personnel can't stand the officers who get all the good food, who get the comfortable living conditions, and who impose very harsh discipline. So the Royal Navy is not a happy and friendly and fun place to be for anybody involved. Now the British actually have a fairly significant naval intelligence program. This consists of an awful lot of sources of information, particularly in American harbors, that will often notify the British for a small fee if there are any British subjects that happen to be serving on American merchant vessels or on American warships. And that's how the British know which ships to stop as soon as they reach international waters. And on June 22nd, 1807, a nasty incident is going to occur. Nine miles off the American coastline, the British HMS Leopard, mounting 54 guns, hails the American USS Chesapeake, mounting 40 guns. We are not at war. These are sovereign ships. But the British have a tip that there are four Irish deserters from the Royal Navy that are serving aboard the USS Chesapeake. So the British hail the Chesapeake, but they don't say, hey, by the way, we're going to come over there, search your ship, take some people off of it, and then wander away. They say, we have dispatches for you. We've got messages for you. And so the Americans say, all right, come on aboard. We'll exchange whatever messages we've got. While on board, a British lieutenant starts talking to different American sailors and determines for himself that sure enough, those four Irish deserters are on board the Chesapeake. So he gets back on his longboat, heads back over to the Leopard, notifies the captain of the Leopard that yes, they are on there. At that point, the Leopard notifies the Chesapeake that they intend to board and remove any deserters from the Royal Navy. Now the American captain in question, not okay with this. That would be a violation of our sovereignty. First of all, we don't have any Irish deserters on here. And second of all, you're not coming on board my ship without my permission. And that's all the provocation that the British need. Rather than further discussions, the British open fire on the American vessel. They fire three broadsides at point-blank range into the Chesapeake with devastating effect. This knocks the Chesapeake completely out of action. The Chesapeake is not able to fire a single gun in response. At the end of the three broadsides, there are three American sailors dead, there are 16 wounded, and for all intents and purposes, the Chesapeake is just a floating pile of matchsticks. And at that point, the British call off the attack and announce, we're coming over. They come aboard the Chesapeake, they select four individuals on the basis of their accents, remove them from the Chesapeake, and then sail off into the sunset, perfectly happy, perfectly satisfied about having done their duty, not at all concerned about the fact that they have just killed American sailors on an American warship. It seems to come as a surprise to the British that the Americans are even upset about this, that the Americans would have a problem with this. Thomas Jefferson is infuriated, but he also knows there's not that much militarily that he can do about it. And that's the unfortunate situation of having allowed your military to atrophy into nothingness in the face of the largest naval power on earth. Sometimes you really do have no choice. Sometimes you really are backed into an untenable situation. So that's gonna fester. And the British are in no hurry to even respond to our diplomatic demands. Now eventually, four years later, the Admiralty will decide on the case uh, of those individuals. Of the four taken off, three are determined to be American citizens and returned. They were born in Ireland, so they were right about that part, but the British decide that maybe pushing this issue this far is a bad idea. The fourth actually was a deserter who actually had jumped ship from a Royal Navy vessel, 
and they executed him out of hand almost immediately upon determining his identity. But they send the other three back. They're going to eventually pay reparations to the United States and by extension to the crew of the Chesapeake who were killed and wounded in the broadside. But it's four years later by the time they actually get around to it. Also four years later, the United States has embarked on a bit of a frigate building program. One of those frigates, the USS President, mounting 54 guns, is essentially sailing up and down the American coastline to try to deter this very type of impressment behavior. It comes across a British ship with 20 guns, and there's a little bit of confusion as to exactly how the messages went back and forth. But the vessel that it comes across is called the Little Belt. Apparently, the captain of the Little Belt was believing that British ships, regardless of size, could stand up to any American vessel uh, and that he would have the full backing of the Royal Navy. On May 16, 1811, the President and the Little Belt begin firing upon each other. To this day, we do not know who fired first, but we do know who fired last uh, because the, the Little Belt is so outclassed, it has no possibility of victory. Most Americans see this as a major win. A vindication for the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. The British see it as an unprovoked attack in international waters, but they're willing to be conciliatory. They're willing to try to prevent any further conflict with the United States because they're still so tied down trying to deal with Napoleon that they can't handle any distractions. They can't send any forces over to the United States. So they're backed into a corner again. The United States, for its part, feels like we're being victimized, mainly because we are. Over the course of 1806 until 1811, 900 American merchant vessels are seized by either French or British privateers or warships. 900 merchant vessels. The cost of insuring a cargo on an American vessel between 1806 and 1811 goes from 10% of the total cost of the goods to almost 40% of the total cost of the goods on board that ship. Because it is so dangerous to venture anywhere away from the American coastline. There are French and British privateers out there looking to make their fortune by seizing on the thinnest of margins uh, of any justification any ship that might be headed towards their enemy. So how do you stop this? Now, you could build up a big navy, you could send all of your vessels in convoys, you could pick a fight with anybody that came nearby, or you could just announce, well, we're just not going to engage in trade anymore. We're going to embargo all trade to Europe. Virtually every dollar of American foreign currency comes from Europe. Virtually all imports come from Europe. On the other hand, American exports account for less than 2% of European trade. So for us to embargo, it cuts off all of our importation ability, all of the things that we've become dependent upon and absolutely love and can't live without, while having almost no effect on the Europeans. They barely notice. This is a mosquito biting a rhinoceros. Uh, the rhino doesn't know, doesn't care, couldn't care less. Uh, so we're cutting off our nose to spite our face. It has an enormously deleterious effect upon northeastern merchants in particular. Very, very painful for anybody that was involved in significant overseas trading. There's a lot of smuggling. Americans have always been somewhat iffy about following our own laws. And when these, when these laws get passed, uh, we wind up seeing smuggling all up and down the coastline, which means now the American government has not only deprived itself of trade, it has also deprived itself of all the revenues that might come from that trade. But Jefferson sees this as the only way that he can protect American vessels from being seized, because we just don't have the capacity to defend ourselves. We're so weak at sea, we have no choice. On land... We continue to have problems in the northwestern frontier. And this cartoon is representative of a lot of the American perspectives as to exactly what the British are doing in the northwest. The British are annoyed at us at sea, so maybe they are paying Native Americans 
to kill and scalp Americans? Maybe not. In fact, there's no evidence that the British are actually paying them to kill. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that the British are trading with Native American tribes, uh, that they're selling them powder, they're selling them guns, they're selling them steel weapons. Uh, but there's no real evidence that the British are actually trying to foment some kind of a significant internal conflict. The person that is trying to foment that conflict, as I mentioned before, is Tecumseh. Tecumseh, a Shawnee, is bound by a treaty, the Fort Wayne Treaty, that effectively ceded lands in what is now Ohio and handed them over to the U.S. government in order to be essentially distributed to the population as the government saw fit. Tecumseh does not feel bound by that agreement. Legally, he might be, but he says, look, I didn't sign it. I wasn't part of it. Therefore, as you can see from this picture at Hatchet Point, he is demanding that the governor of the territory, William Henry Harrison, repudiate the treaty and give the lands back. Harrison absolutely refuses, and this is a, a ridiculously stylized and not remotely accurate picture. Uh, but it's fun to look at, so we're going to stick with it. In reality, what Tecumseh thinks he has to do is prevent his tribe from going the way of the Pequot, from going the way of the Yamasee and the Tuscarora, from going the way of all the tribes that have been singled out by European descended citizens and essentially eradicated. He thinks that what the United States is engaged in is an effort to systematically destroy the Native American tribes in detail. One after another, he wants to forge an alliance. He wants them to put aside their, their ancient grievances to face the common enemy. And in doing so, what Tecumseh is up to is something that has occurred over and over again throughout human history. There is nothing like the fear of the foreign threat to drive populations together. It worked to unify the American colonies. It worked to unify Italy. It worked to unify Germany, and so on and so forth. And so he thinks this might work to forge this pan-Indian confederacy that can hold off any American encroachments. In reality, by this point, from a population standpoint, they have no chance. Uh, there is simply no way. He cannot possibly unify enough groups even if he got everybody uh, to, to unify, it still wouldn't be enough. Uh, the, the population numbers are simply working against him, as are the resources. But Tecumseh is doing what he can. He's actually down on a recruiting trip in, in what is now Alabama. He's talking to members of the Creek tribe, trying to convince them to join. The vast majority of Creeks refuse to do so. Those that identify as the Red Stick Creeks do join his confederacy. But while he's gone... William Henry Harrison sees an opportunity. Tecumseh has a reputation as a gifted tactician, as a cunning uh, enemy. And so if he's gone, but a lot of his followers are still in the immediate area, this might be the opportune moment to attack. And that's exactly what Harrison decides to do. He moves the militia forces under his control towards what is called Prophetstown. Prophetstown is named for Tecumseh's brother, Tenskwatawa who has made a prophecy that this confederacy will succeed. Unfortunately for the Shawnee warriors, Tenskwatawa has also made a prophecy that they will be immune to American bullets. This causes a lot of them to come out into the open and be shot down, uh, rather than hiding amongst the geographic terrain and fighting in their traditional style. Uh, for a brief tangent, we see the exact same type of thing happening today in the 21st century in sub-Saharan Africa. People like the Lord's Resistance Army, for example, you get these war leaders that effectively tell children, anoint yourself with this oil, it will make you bulletproof, it will make you invisible. Uh, and so when people get into a religious fervor, sometimes uh, rationality goes to the side, and that was certainly the case for some of the Shawnee. In the case of this particular fight, Harrison's forces move into the Shawnee territory. They actually pay about a two to one casualty rate to do so, but it's the Shawnee that withdraw. Harrison and his troops burn Prophet's town, and they effectively drive the Shawnee away while demonstrating that the Confederacy is not holding up too well together. So we can see the green area on this map is territory that effectively Harrison is trying to move into. The gray spots are the areas that are covered by the Fort Wayne Treaty and the red triangles are the villages, the significant settlements that represent an obstacle to westward expansion. When the Battle of Tippecanoe, the, the burning of Prophetstown is over, 
The Shawnee, and in particular Tecumseh, are going to retreat across the Canadian border. And British troops will meet Americans at the border and absolutely refuse them the right to come across in pursuit of the retreating Shawnee. So now the British have actively decided to offer sanctuary to enemies of the U U.S. government. As you might imagine, this is not going to be a popular move. We have a budding demand for war. We have individuals who are convinced that the United States must go to war against Britain to assert its own principles, to guarantee freedom of navigation on the seas, to guarantee the British stop offering succor to our enemies on our own soil, and to guarantee access to foreign markets. The presidency is occupied by James Madison, father of the Constitution, who understands better than anybody the, the notion of checks and balances and the importance of the different branches of the government. But the leader of the pro-war group, who style themselves the War Hawks, is the young Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, pictured on the right. Fantastic sideburns on the man, just, just glorious. And Clay and his followers are constantly drumming towards this notion that we must go to war. We must prepare ourselves. They're going to, in early 1812, raise the size of the U.S. Army. They are going to authorize a growth from 5,000 to 10,000 troops in the permanent army. The raising of 25,000 regulars for one year of service. The raising of 50,000 volunteers for one year of service. And the raising and re-equipping of 100,000 militia for one year of service. So we're going to take an army of 5,000 and we're going to expand that hypothetically into 185,000 troops for one year of service. And in one year, we think, we'll have all the time we need for those forces to sweep across the border into Canada, primarily, of course, just in pursuit of Tecumseh, but since we're there anyways, we might as well capture everything and keep it, because we kind of sort of assume the Canadians won't mind and that they'll totally be okay with joining the United States because, you know, they're like us, right? But more polite. For those of you keeping track, by the way, the U.S. has invaded Canada three times. We are currently 0-3 against the Canadians. Uh, my Canadian friends like to remind me of this fact on a regular basis. So we're going to build ourselves an army, and if you're going to have an army in a time of... of you know, being as fiscally responsible as possible. There's no sense in building one if you're not going to unleash it. And you're going to unleash it for the highest of principles, for the best of good reasons. You're going to unleash it to prove to the world that we will stand up for the rights of neutrals. That we will not bow down before dictatorial monarchs, whether they be French, whether they be British, it's irrelevant that we will be this beacon of light and hope in the world. It's not at all for self-interest and opportunism and taking something away from the British while they're distracted in Europe and making money off of both sides in a conflict. This sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? I mean, who's on board with this? This is going to be fantastic. We're finally going to win one. This is going to be great. We declare war. We declare war on June 18th, 1812. This is the narrowest margin of any U.S. declared war. 61% of legislators vote in favor of it. In the Senate, the vote is 19 to 13. In the House, the vote is 79 to 49. It's almost entirely voted yes from South and Western delegates and almost entirely no from North and Eastern delegates. The ones that expect to profit are on board. The ones that expect to lose money are absolutely against it. So we declare war expecting things are going to be great because we have nothing to worry about. The British can't possibly divert any forces to North America. Napoleon has organized a grand armée of 600,000 troops and then chose to march it into Russia. And by the end of the year, there's only going to be 30,000 of them left. 
and suddenly the British are going to have a lot more attention for us. And this is not going to go the way we thought it was going to. But we don't have to talk about that in here, because this is all about why the U.S. goes to war. So bottom line, why did the U.S. go to war in 1812? Number one, opportunism. We saw a chance to take somebody else's stuff when they were unable to stop us. Thucydides would be 100% on board. Two, outrage. We're being somewhat petulant. We're angry about being picked on, and we're not going to take it any longer. Three, projectionism. We assume that the Canadians feel the same way about the British government as we had 30 years before. So we assume that the Canadians are trying to throw off the yoke of British imperialism, and the only thing that's stopping them is the lack of enough Canadians. When in reality, the Canadians are actually perfectly content. They're perfectly happy with the status quo, and they have no interest in joining the United States. And finally, we do this because it gives us the necessary powers under the Constitution. In a declaration of war situation, there are very few, if any, limits on presidential power. Uh, this is something that, that scholars have been wrestling over for almost 200 years now, of what, what are the limits of what a president can do. And with Madison as the president, this is a guy who understood what theoretically those limits might be because he wrote them. And for all intents and purposes, Madison is going to become a dictator. At one point in the war, he's going to assume personal command of the army, despite having no experience with military matters whatsoever. It's a terrible idea. But because you have a declared war, that effectively means the government can issue money that otherwise it wouldn't be allowed to issue. It can go into debt. It can demand the service of its citizenry. And it can engage in a war of conquest against the Native Americans. In many ways, though we declare war on Britain, the primary enemy are Native American tribes that are resisting American expansionism. And when you look at some of the great works on the War of 1812, what they will tell you is, there's not really a winner of this war. At the end of it, we're going to go back to the status quo. By the end of the War of 1812, Napoleon has been deposed for the first time, not for the second time, but that doesn't take too many months longer. By the end of the War of 1812, the British have no more national emergency, so they're going to give us the concessions that we ostensibly went to war over. By the end of the War of 1812, Canada will remain in British hands, uh, despite some, some really heavy fighting up there. Canada will remain in British hands. So for all intents and purposes, we go back to the status quo antebellum, except for the Native American tribes. While there's no real winner of the, the War of 1812, there is a significant loser. Uh, because this is going to give the justification that the American presidency needs for its new policy of non-assimilation and exile. It's going to be this war that leads Andrew Jackson, for example, to issue his removal order, that the five civilized tribes will be moved out of southeast United States and to the newly named Indian Territory, uh, modern-day Oklahoma. And that's just mean-spirited, sending people to Oklahoma against their will. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come out and talk. I'm perfectly happy to entertain any questions you might have. Sir. Thank you, uh, Brian Harding again, my community college, Flint. Um, I was just wondering, I, I, I thought the United States invaded and in, uns unsuccessfully Canada twice. I didn't know it was actually three times. Three times if you count the, uh, the Seven Years' War, so the French and Indian War. I see, so okay. So we, we invade during the Revolutionary War, mm -hmm. Benedict right. Arnold's in charge of that invasion. Uh, it does not go well. We invaded once when it was still under French control, so French Canada. It did not go well. Uh, and then we, we obviously invaded in the War of 1812, and it really didn't go well. So right. uh, we burned the Canadian capital such as it was. The British response was to burn ours. Uh, oh, just uh, incidentally, uh, this past summer I happened to go to the Shropshire Regimental Museum in Shropshire, England, and they actually have uh, mementos uh, uh, taken from American troops who uh, dropped everything and ran as fast away as they could from Washington, D.C. at the Battle of Sharpsville, Sharpsburg. Sharpsburg yeah. and Bladensburg. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's incredibly, uh, this war from a tactical standpoint is incredibly embarrassing to look at. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's what happens when amateurs come out to play with professionals. Uh, and it takes the Americans a very long time to figure out how to act in a professional manner. Um, and even at the end, with overwhelming numbers, it's still, there's a lot of luck involved. I mean, a lot of Americans think we won the war. 
because the last fight of the war is at New Orleans, which occurs after the peace treaty has been signed but before anybody hears about it. We win at New Orleans, and by winning I mean Jackson with a ragtag band including about 800 pirates fights off a really poorly, really poorly carried out amphibious assault. The British withdraw and word of the Battle of New Orleans reaches the, the major urban population centers at the same time as word of the Treaty of Ghent. And so the newspapers are covering it on the same day. Hey, we went at New Orleans and the war's over. Victory! But when you look a little deeper, we don't get anything out of the war. Uh, you know, this is not a traditional as defined you know, unconditional surrender, not even close. It's more of a, okay, that was unpleasant, let's just agree to, to knock it off. Uh, and it's a total sideshow. I mean, the, the, the Americans were, were fielding forces of a few thousand troops. Napoleon is fighting his battles with 150,000 under his personal command. Uh, and so to the British, this is a sideshow. But by 1814, when Napoleon gets removed, when the, when the final coalition drives him out and he surrenders and goes into exile, the first thing the British announce through diplomatic channels is, by the way, this guy, the Duke of Wellington, that totally beat Napoleon, yeah, he's going on a, an extended North American tour. So say hi to him when he gets there. Uh, and that's a pretty effective tactic. It's a pretty good intimidation factor. Sir. Hi, I'm uh, Freddie LaFemina. I uh, teach in uh, New Jersey, uh, Ridgewood uh, High School. Um, I guess my question is uh, around the idea of this Indian problem, like uh, calling, it a, calling it a problem. And um, I was just wondering if you thought that would be a helpful theme for uh, thinking about American war throughout the 19th century, uh, as just, or even 18th and 19th, as a, as a recurring feature. Um, and uh, what you think changes over time? And then also, um, is opposition to the war uh, animated even rhetorically by uh, arguments about not, uh, not confronting Native Americans or protecting them or anything like that? Or is there more or less consensus, building consensus around um, non-assimilation? So to, to answer your first question, yes, absolutely. There is an enormous amount of material that you could work with in, in terms of, I mean, you could do a, a great unit just on the opportunism of attacking Native American groups. Mm -hmm. So you look during the American Civil War, there's an enormous right. amount of fighting against Native American groups uh, just completely elsewhere. And there's Native American groups that use the U.S. Civil War as an opportunity mm -hmm. to attack as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there's, there's absolutely something to be done there. Now, there is no real significant paternalism in 1812 towards the, the Native American groups. There, there's a little bit here and there, but in reality, there's no substantial movement for they must be protected, they must be preserved. Um, in general, most people just see them as being in the way or as being a danger, uh, an, an uncivilized, barbarian civil, uh, group that, that cannot be civilized. And, and that's part of the presumption, is that they cannot be brought into the fold because uh, you know, they, they haven't chosen to assimilate over the course of the last 150 years, so obviously they don't want to. Now, in reality, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's definitely a very skewed view, and, and of course there's a certain ethnocentrism to assuming that they ought to assimilate, um, but there's really no significant opposition to the war on the grounds that, that attacking the Native Americans would be wrong. And I'll just slide one, one to your left there, sir. I'll, I'll hit all three of you in, in, in a row, so whichever one of you wants to go next. Sure. Hi, uh, David Lonborg, New York City. Earlier on, you mentioned that uh, when the war got started, there, of course, uh, since then, it's not really talked very much about in the history books. It's a forgotten war for the most part. It's very much glossed over in many cases. And one of the things that, one of the reasons for that is the mentioning that we invaded Canada, and rarely do we want to say that we were the aggressors, the invaders. And some years ago, we were at a museum in Canada, and they, in big letters, it talked about the American invasion of Canada. So one of my questions is, how is the War of 1812 portrayed in Canadian schools, textbooks, or uh, in England for that matter as well? How do they generally portray this conflict? So the English answer is it's pretty much not. Uh, it's a footnote yes. at best because any English textbook that's talking about conflict in that time period is talking about the fight against Napoleon. And, and being the heart of the coalition. Canadian textbooks, on the other hand, this is a big deal. Americans outnumber Canadians more than 10 to 1 in 1812. Uh, and so for them to have fought off an invasion, to them, is, is proof positive of uh, national vigor and, and martial capability and success. Um, so it, it is a much bigger deal there. 
Now, I mean, there, there were a lot of factors working on behalf of the Canadians that, that uh, probably helped them out. And, and so, I mean, the theme of this, this conference, obviously, is why we go to war. But a quick anecdote for you. In our initial invasion, essentially, the regulars go across the river into Canada, and the militia refuses to follow. The militia, which is the bulk of the forces in question designated for the invasion, just says, sorry, we're a defense force. We're staying right here in New York. We're not coming over. To which the regulars go, but if you don't come over, we're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to be destroyed. Well, sorry, shouldn't have crossed the river. <laughs> well, could you at least send the boats back? Well, no, these are our boats. We're not going to let you use the boats again. So not only does the militia refuse to come over, they refuse to even bring the boats back to evacuate the regulars. They just leave them out there hanging. Uh, and, and as you might imagine, this does not go well. The American force is forced to surrender. Uh, it's horrifically embarrassing, and there's all kinds of recriminations. Um, the militia has this special place in, in American society uh, post-American Revolutionary War. Uh, there's, there's a big argument for about 50 years about who was more responsible for winning our independence. Was it the militia who comprised the bulk of the troops, or was it Washington and his Continentals who were a smaller but professionalized force? Politically speaking, the militia so outnumbers the regulars that the official answer becomes the militia are responsible for our revolutionary success. Even though in, in practice, that's not true. I mean, Washington summed it up as the militia show up, they eat all the food, and they go home. They don't, they don't really do anything other than, you know, occasionally seeing their numbers is intimidating unless somebody gets close enough to realize their militia. Uh, and so, you know, this War of 1812, I said to you, 185,000 troops, which sounds huge, but 100,000 of those are militia who tend to be very poorly trained, poorly armed, have no discipline, uh, insist on arguing with their officers about everything, and, and if subjected to any kinds of regulation or anything like that, uh, they just leave. They just quit and go home. And there's really no repercussions to that. They don't get punished as deserters. They don't get hanged. Uh, they just go home. Uh, so they're incredibly frustrating. But the Canadians, yeah, they, they teach it. They love it. Uh, you know, I, I think it's probably grown in prominence over the last 200 years, uh, which is to say, you know, the, the more powerful the U.S. becomes, the more exciting it is to have beaten them. So just a guess. Sir. Hi, uh, Jay LeBlanc from Littleton, Colorado. Um, you also mentioned about the, you know, talking about this as the second American Revolution and seeing it as, in some ways, as a sequel. I'm wondering about the generational aspect of that, that you're talking about leadership that 30 years earlier was the young soldiers or the, um, you know, the kids during the American Revolution and how that affects the motivation of people to want their own um, generation of, of leadership, like Andrew Jackson talking about that he saw this as a debt of retaliation because he had been injured, you know, as a kid during the American Revolution, that type of thing. I'm just wondering if you see that as one of the motivators for new generation wanting their own fight against the British. There's, there's definitely some truth to that, particularly from leaders, officers, and, and political leaders. The bulk of the troops that you're talking about were born after the Revolution. So they've heard tales about it. But from time immemorial, young people have done dumb things, uh, like signing up for a really bad, really bad war. Um, and, and so you know, youth, youth are wonderful because they're enthusiastic and energetic, and they, they believe they can change the world. Uh, and, and they believe in, in all of these high ideals that as we get older, we become a little more jaded about. Um, but, but in terms of who's volunteering for this war, uh, the vast majority of the troops are, are in this 16 to 21 year old range. No, I, I was really more wondering about the motivation of the leadership in terms of making the decision for this war. Do you think their, their choices were determined by what they had grown up with? I, I would say no, not, not in particular. Um, first of all, the vast majority of the, the key leaders that are actually voting on this measure also were too young to have had anything to do with the revolution. Uh, so Henry Clay, for example, He's the Speaker of the House, and he's 31 years old. Uh, you know, he's, he's one of the youngest ever. Uh, I think he might be the youngest ever, if I remember correctly. And, and the vast majority of the, the politicians are, are not of the revolutionary generation. Madison is kind of sort of vaguely of the revolutionary generation, but kind of sort of not as well. He's, he's just young enough 
that he remembers the revolution well, but he wasn't in any way, shape, or form central to it. Uh, and so I, I don't think there's a whole lot of, um, we, we have to go to war with Britain because that's what the last generation did and that's what we're going to do. If this was Scotland, I would 100% agree. You know, we, we fight the English because that's what we do and it's our turn. But uh, for the U.S., that, I don't think there's a whole lot to that. Uh, so we've got one over here. Sir. Um, Richard Vandenbosch, Modesto, California. Um, I had attended a seminar from uh, Dr. Alan Taylor from UC Davis. I'm not sure if you know him, but he had spoke about, because we're kind of talking about the se second uh, war for independence, but he had spoke more of it as the first civil war and the idea that uh, former Americans had moved up to this area and also the divisiveness that it created uh, with New England. Would you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So this is not a popular war in New England. I mean, there's actually a movement in New England to secede from the United States and rejoin the British. That thing gets kind of blown out of proportion afterwards. Um, at the time, it was there were some firebrands that said we should do this, but there was not a groundswell of support for leaving the United States. But there was an awful lot of resistance to things like sending resources and sending state forces uh, to, to fight the war. And, and the group of US volunteers, that, that this is 35,000 of the 185,000 troops, the states get to pick who their officers are going to be. And so the states are picking people, if you're in the Northeast, who have no interest in leading those forces across state borders. If you're in the South and the West, they're going to pick aggressive individuals that want to go and get involved in the fight. Uh, it's often referred to as the Second War of Independence because it's the same opponent. But in reality, at no time do the British have any interest in trying to reabsorb the American colonies. The British are literally trying to fight this war as cheap as possible they, they want to put this fight out of the way. Uh, when they finally get to the point of burning Washington, it's because the first two years of trying to hold the Americans off at arm's length has not been enough for the Americans to go away. Um, how many of you have younger siblings? Okay. So think back to your childhood and your younger siblings. Uh, you know, I was the younger sibling, and I would, I would get enraged at my older sister, and my older sister's usual method of fighting was to put her hand on my forehead and just let me swing away. And that's what the British are doing for the first two years of the war, is they're trying to do everything they can to just make the Americans quit, just knock it off. By 1814, they finally decide, okay, the Americans aren't just gonna quit, so what do we do? Well, by European standards, if I capture the enemy's capital, it's game over. So there's their capital, let's go capture it, and then the Americans will quit and go away. Um, they almost managed to capture the president, which would have been a nice bonus. Um, in the end, even that's not enough to make us quit, in part because Washington is such a young city and, and so not important to, to the Americans yet. Uh, had they done that to New York, had they done that to Philadelphia, maybe that would have been enough to, to really make us quit. Uh, but by doing it to Washington, I mean, you know, what comes out of that for us? Their follow-on attack at Fort McHenry. And now we're singing a national anthem about it uh, to the tune of a British drinking song. But that's, you know, a totally different issue. So, so to a certain extent, I mean, it's, it's, it's really bizarre to watch how much the Americans are invested in this and how little the British care. The British for the whole war have no idea why we declared war on them. They, they really don't get it. Uh, and, and so they're stunned that this little pipsqueak nation is going gonna, is gonna to pick this fight for what to them seems like no purpose. And, and you know, here we are just determined to prove that we're a big player now. Uh, we've got a big army and a huge navy of a handful of ships. Uh, and so uh, when you look at the, the actual engagements, there's a bunch of one-on-one -on -one ship engagements. And, and it, this is U.S. vessels picking fights with a single British vessel. And we win two, draw one, and lose one. And we call that, hey, that's a win in the war, right? We, of the four ship engagements, we won two of them. So... Clearly, we're the superior naval power. Thank you very much. You know, it's, to the British, this is, this is a sideshow uh, and almost an embarrassing one. Sir. Well, I, I don't think there was really much of a threat with war with England in the first place, but... Yeah, we spin it as a win for ourselves. You know, we, we feel like we won. Uh, and from that standpoint, yeah, you could absolutely call it a win. If you, if you came out of it getting what you wanted, or at least part of what you wanted, 
then okay, uh, you know, I'm willing to I'm willing to accept that as a win. Uh, the school that I teach at, we have a lot of foreign officers, and we had a debate about the the Arab-Israeli War of 1973, and our Egyptian officer basically said, hey, as far as we're concerned, that was a win. We fought Israel to a draw. We got the Sinai back. That's a win. And the Israeli is going, no, that was a win for us. You know, we, we halted your invasion. We drove you back. Uh, we got a peace deal. You know, you're the only country that's actually signed a peace treaty with us. That's a win. It's nice when both sides can come out of a war and call it a win. If you ask the British, they would tell you they won the War of 1812. They burned our capital. At no point was anything significant of theirs under any threat. Uh, the, the entire war was fought on our territory. And at the end, they got exactly what they wanted. And so, you know, it's, it's nice when we can all walk away feeling like winners as long as none of us self-identify as Shawnee. So, I'm not saying that as a joke. I'm saying that as, you know, Native American tribes are the unmitigated loser of this fight. Uh, but everybody else, sure, I, I mean, they can call it a win if they want to. But, but from the traditional standards, it's a draw. Yeah. Third. Paul, you mentioned uh, that James Madison, perhaps more than anybody else, knew the limits on uh, presidential power because he wrote them into the Constitution. And yet the declaration of war uh, unleashes presidential powers. I'm just curious as to what he was thinking. Uh, was he conflicted about this apparent contradiction or not? Well, I don't think he saw it as a contradiction. Because essentially, I mean, the Constitution does not lay out how to do much from a practical standpoint. It lays out the organizations and trusts them to, to function. But it does very specifically say, this is how you declare war, and here's who's in charge. And if you make the president a dictator under a declaration of war, and the only way that a declaration of war can stop being a situation of war is that the president negotiates a peace treaty, which is then ratified by the Senate to essentially turn off the war, I think he fully well understood what that meant, because Madison based a lot of the Constitution off of Roman Republican law. And the Roman Republic, on a number of occasions, would vote dictatorial power on a temporary basis to an individual because they understood that Republican democracies are not good at conducting war without one person in charge to streamline decision making. And so I think Madison fully understood that war is such an exceptional crisis that you, you don't have time for trusting a room full of people to figure out exactly how we're gonna, how we're gonna do things. Uh, you know, if you want, an ex if you want a, a simple experiment of this type, just walk into a room full of 20 people and invite them to lunch, but don't tell them where. And they'll start fighting immediately over where we're going to go to lunch. If you walk into that same group and you say, hey, who wants to go to lunch at X, the vast majority of them will come along. Uh, but if you leave it open, they'll discuss it all day. They'll, they'll waste the entire lunch hour arguing about where to go. Uh, and so Madison certainly understood that notion. And, and personally, if I can wander off on a tangent again here, I would tell you that in many ways, the U.S. has now almost made it impossible for us to declare war. Now, that's partly because the United Nations Charter effectively says you're not allowed to declare war on other people except under very extreme circumstances. It's partly because Congress in the United States is absolutely terrified of handing that level of power over to a president ever again. You look at the War Powers Act, and this is Congress effectively saying, we will grant you some of the powers of war under certain circumstances, but not all of them. We reserve the right, for example, to turn off funding. Under a declaration of war, Congress doesn't get to turn off funding. The president as dictator can effectively fund whatever he or she wants. And we saw that in World War II, where President Roosevelt is engaging in enormous deficit spending on a, a wide variety of projects that Congress is not consulted on, not told about, not allowed to be aware of. Uh, look at the Manhattan Project, $2 billion dollars for the development of a weapon system that may or may not work. Roosevelt thought in his capacity as president it was absolutely necessary. So he did it. But he didn't go to Congress and ask for $2 billion. He just spent the $2 billion. And a further $3 billion on the plane to deliver said atomic bomb. Uh, that's how war works when you're in a declaration of war in the United States. But imagine a scenario where Congress declares war and the president refuses to negotiate an end. 
Congress doesn't have a mechanism to force the president to negotiate an end. Now, theoretically, the president could be replaced in an election, right? And we've had wartime elections before. Art, you, you look like you really want to jump on this. For a very fine presentation, Paul, and very stimulating as well as informative. I wanted to follow up on the sectional point that you raised and, and the very good question about that. My impression has always been that New England really redefined itself as a distinctive part of the country because they were not in favor of this war. And that following from that, given their capital and educational resources, New England and the old Anglo establishment became extremely important in American banking, industry generally, certainly foreign policy, uh, at least up until Vietnam. Is that an accurate impression or is that a misperception? Absolutely. This is where, North, uh, where the New England identity really emerges, uh, where, where they really start to see themselves as a, a regional conglomeration as opposed to individual states that occasionally have similar interests that happen to be next to each other. Uh, so from that standpoint, yeah, this, this is, again, that, that common outsider, that threat or that enemy is driving these states together that hadn't always liked each other very much and hadn't always played very well together. Uh, now, you know, obviously shortly after the War of 1812, Massachusetts is going to spin off Maine into its own separate state, uh, which in some ways is, uh, you know, I mean, they're cutting more than half of their territory when they do that, but they're also increasing the clout of New England in the Senate. They're creating two Senate seats out of thin air, uh, out of Massachusetts territory. And when you're talking about a Senate in 1812 only had 32 members, when you add two more senators that hypothetically will have your regional interests at heart, that can really swing the balance, uh, especially if other states start doing the same thing. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Looks like we, we've got your back up. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. My vision to the peripheral is not good, so no, no you may problem. have to just start waving. Oh, no problem. Um, my name is Lenore Hano. I'm from Centennial High School in Minnesota. And uh, my question is, I'm primarily a world history teacher, and uh, I like to find ways to embed elements of American history when possible. And I'm wondering if you can think of any comparisons with other parts of the world in treatment of indigenous peoples that would be an appropriate comparison contrast piece um, between how a sure. power treated as indigenous For, peoples. Thank you. It's always been my belief that when you put two populations of humans together, they're going to do two things. One of them is fight, and the other one's fornicate. And you, you see mixed populations as a result. You know, I'm being polite by using that term, but um, pretty much anywhere you see European colonial movements, you see these kinds of, of how are we going to respond to the natives. Now, sometimes those natives are... are technologically uh, uh, completely behind. We see that in North America, for example, where you, you essentially have a Stone Age culture at the time of first contact. Uh, and, and over time, you're going to see some reversals. So you, you, you fast forward a little bit to the Battle of Little Bighorn, the Native Americans are better armed than the American Army troops that are there uh, because they've been purchasing their weapons on the open market, whereas the U.S. Army is going for cost savings. And so the, the U.S. Army troopers that are there are firing single shot rifled muskets, whereas the, the Native Americans are firing repeater rifles. Uh, and not surprisingly, this does not turn out well. You see some conflict between the Australians and their Aboriginal populations. You see a lot of conflict between uh, European populations in Southeast Asia and the Native populations there. So, for example, one of our speakers, Dr. Silby, has a fantastic work on the Boxer Rebellion, which in many ways, the Boxer Rebellion is an example of this, this sort of concept of, wait a minute, we're not sure we like having you in our territory. We're not sure we want you to be part of this. Maybe we'll make a movement to try to drive you out. Uh, and, and we see that over the course of kind of waves. So in the 19th century, you see some of that. You see an enormous wave of, of this type of conflict really in the 20th century post-World War II. The, the anti-colonial movement, there is an awful lot of examples of, for lack of a better term, the natives trying to drive out the, the, the invaders. You see it in sub-Saharan Africa, you see it in the Middle East, uh, and, and sometimes it's, it's the Europeans' own fault. You know, when Lawrence of Arabia starts going around and whipping up support against the Ottomans, who are invaders, this has the secondary effect of creating this nationalism and this fervor against the Europeans who decide to replace them. So, so anywhere you see 
one population trying to move into territory that's already occupied, you're going to see some elements of that. Sir? I was going to say I could ask one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but uh, I'll, I'll just ask it. Um, I was just wondering, I was looking at your bio, and I know that you take a lot of these ideas into the, to the present very close, and so I wanted to ask you about dr um, drone warfare or uh, – because it, it seemed like a, a really um, useful idea to talk about uh, Congress not declaring war formally as actually a way of holding on to power and oversight, not the opposite. Um, and so I, I was just wondering if you could take that idea and the War Powers Act forward to today and if, like, um, you know, for instance, is, is what happened in Libya an example of President Obama's power being reined in uh, as a result of uh, sort of the balance of power between the con Congress and the President, and then in the context of this drone warfare, which I'm sure we'll talk about a lot, um, just sort of low-grade warfare that people are not feeling in many, many countries happening right, right this second, you know, uh, sort of at the, at the helm of the, the executive, it seems like. So if we take Libya, for example, the War Powers Act says you have to notify Congress if you're going to send troops anywhere. You have to notify Congress within a set period of time of the fact that you have done that, and you need congressional approval if you're going to leave them there more than 30 days. You don't have to notify Congress if you're sending machines. You only have to notify Congress if you're sending American personnel. And if you can fight a war that doesn't put any American personnel at risk, then hypothetically, you don't have to notify Congress of anything that you're attempting to do. Now, in practice, if you launch an airstrike with a, a Reaper drone, uh, over Benghazi, that's an act of war. That's, that's engaging in an act of violence on enemy sovereign soil, and that's an act of war. But it's definitely not a declared war under U.S. law. Uh, in 2001, the authorization for the use of military force just effectively said, and you should read this, if you've never read the AUMF, you should. It'll take you less than a minute. Uh, it's shocking that, that the level of violence that you are able to enact can be done on less than a page. But the authorization to use military force effectively says the president has the power to engage al-Qaeda or any affiliated groups anywhere in the world on his own authority uh, until and unless that AUMF is rescinded. Uh, since the AUMF is a congressional action, they can rescind it anytime they feel like it. But the political cost of announcing we're not going to let the president attack al-Qaeda and its affiliates uh, far, oh, far too overwhelming. It's, uh, I do not anticipate the AUMF ever being revoked under any circumstances. Nor does it necessarily have to be expanded. After all, how do you define somebody as being an Al-Qaeda affiliate? The Islamic State and Al-Qaeda have effectively been at war against each other, but the Islamic State grew out of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So therefore, there was some affiliation for a while, and an awful lot of the leadership of the Islamic State we're b members of Al-Qaeda. So therefore, that's all the affiliation we need, right? Uh, you, you look at groups like Boko Haram in Nigeria, which has pledged formally its, its support and allegiance to the Islamic State. So now, by extension, it's okay if we attack them because A is related to B, B is related to C, C is related to D. Therefore, by the transitive property, A is related to D. Uh, and, and you can just kind of constantly expand these networks. If you can find a single link between them, and you always can, then by extension, it's perfectly fine to attack them, and you've effectively allowed the U.S. to engage in war in perpetuity uh, without any real checks. Now, hypothetically, you could cut the military budget, but we've seen how that goes over politically as well. Uh, you know, we, we currently spend 10 times as much as, as the next highest spender, and yet it's not enough. We're, we're trying to spend even more. And so, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to comment on whether it's a good or bad thing. My salary comes from that, uh, though my salary is considerably less than the cost of a <laughs> Reaper drone, I can assure you. So, I'm cheap. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Sir. Uh, Brent Mills, uh, Houston, Gigum. Gigum, right uh, back at you. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about Clausewitz and the Trinity and, and the symmetry between society and, and, and the military. And, and I want to get your thoughts on how much did that mythology of the revolution reliance on citizen soldiers and society's expectations of that classical Machiavellian reliance on militia, how much over the course of U.S. military history has that caused us to start slow and finish strong because of our lack of reliance on regulars as opposed to society's idea that soldiers of democracy have to be citizen soldiers? There's, there's a fantastic book that I would encourage all of you to check out. 
uh, by Heller and Stoft entitled America's First Battles. And what they did was they, they looked at the first battle of, at the time they wrote it, every American conflict. And what they found was the U.S. had lost the first fight over and over and over because the U.S. tends to go to war completely unprepared for war. The exception to that rule, Vietnam. Vietnam, we won the first major engagement. Uh, and, and they kind of pointed to that and said, hey, look, we're kind of changing our approach here, and that may not turn out well for us. Uh, that, in fact, winning the first battle may not always be a good thing, because if you learn more from failure than you do from success, losing the first battle, as long as it's not so catastrophic as to remove you from the fight, may cause you to reevaluate how you're going about conflict. Winning the first battle, on the other hand, may cause you to keep doing the same thing over and over again, even if it has become a very bad idea. And we certainly saw that in Vietnam. This notion of the militia being the key to the victory, this is partly because Americans love to elect war heroes, and we always have. Whether it's George Washington being the only, uh, the only president unanimously elected by the Electoral College, um, or whether it's Madison actually had the opportunity and one elector voted against him just so that Washington would hold the title still. Uh, but this, this notion of electing military heroes, it happens all the time. And it's often part of the vetting process, right? What was your military service? What did you do? How many military veterans are there in Congress? Uh, one game I like to play with my military officers when we're, when we're doing icebreakers is, tell me about the most awkward time you've been thanked for your service. Because that's become part of, of the American behavior now. Uh, you, oh, you're in the military, thank you for your service. It just, just immediately flows, right? Thank you for your service, thank you for your service. And that's great, we, we should thank our military, we should thank the individuals that protect us, but there's a time and a place. Uh, and, and there are times where the, the, we get some great stories about, uh, you know, here's what was going on and it was, you know, my, my seven kids are having a meltdown in the middle of an Applebee's and, and this person comes over and interrupts in the middle of my children losing their minds to thank me for my service. And, you know, it's very nice that you wanna thank me, but Maybe not right this minute, you know, I'm kind of, kind of busy here. Uh, and so, you know, we get, some, we get some really funny stories out of that. And I'm sure we have veterans in the room here that could also tell you some funny stories about how they've been thanked for their service. Uh, I get thanked for my service all the time, and it makes no sense to me because I am a civilian. I come from a long line of cowards. I have never faced any kind of a combat deployment. Uh, but people see an, an Air Force ID, and they thank me for my service. And I think, you know, that's, I didn't earn that. I don't want that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the equivalent of the militia, I guess, in that regard. The power, the political power of the American Reserves and National Guard is largely derived from this militia tradition. The idea of the citizen soldier is derived from this. The idea of the greatest generation. You know, World War II, you put 16 million troops into uniform and think of the political power of those returning World War II veterans. And, and it's that same principle. Uh, they're leveraging it for political power, not necessarily in a, a negative fashion, not in an opportunistic fashion. It's just simply part of who they are. Uh, it's part of society. And social leaders in the, the 18th and 19th century, the, the captain of the militia company is almost certainly going to be one of the prominent members of the local area. It'll be the doctor or the lawyer uh, or the individual that served in the regulars uh, and is now the shopkeeper but is also captain fill-in-the-blank. Uh, you know, and, and they will refer to them using their militia rank for the rest of their lives. So, it's a fascinating thing to watch. I, I see that the, the hook's coming, so. <laughs> I, I don't like having you behind me. It makes me nervous. <laughs>